Welcome, everyone. I'm Suzanne Maloney. I'm Vice President and Director of the Foreign Policy Program here at the Brookings Institution. And I'm delighted to welcome you to today's exciting event marking the release of an important new book titled U.S.-Taiwan Relations, Will China's Challenge Lead to a Crisis? It is a great honor to help launch such a profoundly important study of U.S.-Taiwan relations and to celebrate its truly impressive co-authors. Ryan Haas and Richard Bush, who are my colleagues here at Brookings, and Bonnie Glazer of the German Marshall Fund. I want to congratulate them on the, uh, the, the publication of this book. Growing concerns about China's intentions and plans for Taiwan have prompted an enormous amount of policy attention on cross-strait affairs here in Washington and around the world. Some U.S. officials have called for actions that may depart from the longstanding U.S. policy posture on Taiwan and risk more harm than benefit for the long-term objectives that are shared by the United States and Taiwan, namely peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. Bonnie, Richard, and Ryan responded to an increasingly overheated debate on Taiwan with a book that calls for calm and informed policymaking. The book lays out the past, present, and future of the Taiwan Strait and appeals to decision makers to appreciate Taiwan and its 23.5 million people not as chess pieces in some great power competition, but as friends of the United States who share similar ideals and aspirations with the American people. The authors also explain how America can best support Taiwan and its people in their contest for the future. I can't imagine a more timely or relevant study. The authors draw on their deep knowledge and hands-on expertise in writing this book. Ryan Haas, is currently a senior fellow in the Michael H. Armacost Chair in Foreign Policy here at Brookings, where he holds a joint appointment to the John L. Thornton China Center and the Center for East Asia Policy Studies. He is also the Chen Fu and Cecilia Yen Gu Chair in Taiwan Studies here at Brookings. Prior to joining the institution, Ryan served as Director for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia on the National Security Council staff. In that role, he advised President Obama and senior White House officials on all aspects of U.S. policy toward China, Taiwan, and Mongolia, and coordinated the implementation of U.S. policy throughout the region. We're also joined today by the second co-author, Bonnie S. Glazer, who is the managing director of the German Marshall Fund's Indo-Pacific program. She is also a non-resident fellow with the Lowy Institute in Sydney, Australia, and a senior associate with the Pacific Forum. She has worked at the intersection of Asia-Pacific geopolitics and U.S. policy for more than three decades, including at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and in government service at the Departments of Defense and State. Finally, we're also joined by our third co-author here today, Richard Bush. Richard has spent more than 20 years with Brookings, helping to found what is now our Center for East Asia Policy Studies, where he is currently a non-resident senior fellow. Richard started his career at the Asia Society and went on to serve in the U.S. government for many years, including in positions with the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the National Intelligence Council. From 1997 to 2002, he served as chairman and managing director of the American Institute in Taiwan, the mechanism through which the United States government conducts substantive relations with Taiwan in the absence of diplomatic relations. And we're, of course, thrilled to have the PBS NewsHour foreign affairs and defense correspondent, Nick Schifrin, who will moderate a discussion among the three authors of this masterful book. Following their conversation, we will open the discussion to those of you here in the audience for questions and answers. Microphones will be passed around the audience. A quick reminder that we're live and on the record. If viewers would like to submit your questions, those of you who are watching this program virtually, please do so at the email address events at brookings.edu or on Twitter at the hashtag US Taiwan Relations. Since this is a book event, let me just say that the book is currently on sale, available for purchase in our bookstore in the lobby of the Brookings Institution, or at any online realtor of your choice. I encourage you to pick up a copy. There could be no more important book at this moment. Nick, the floor is now yours. Suzanne, thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. I will just say that you're not going to get the signed copy if you order it online. You'll get the signed copy in the lobby. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's my plug. Thank you. Um, Ryan Haas, it is your uh, name at the top. Uh, so you get the first big question, which you ask yourself in the book title. And what I'm going to do here is uh, we're just going to do a quick first round, get some of the big thoughts from all three of you. 
Uh, and then uh, the book has been divided into three, past, uh, present, kind of, uh, last few years, uh, and then future. Um, Richard has written the past, Bonnie's written the, the present, if you will, and Ryan's written the future. So we'll, we'll split up the rest of the conversation based on how they split up the writing of the book. But the first round is the overall. Uh, and Ryan, you get the question that you ask in your subtitle, will China's challenge lead to a crisis? Well, first of all, Nick, thank you for uh, being here. And it's wonderful to be among so many friends and uh, to have the online audience. My, my family's watching from Seattle, so hello to you. <laughs> Will China's challenge lead to crisis? Uh, I'll tell you my answer. I'm sure my colleagues will, will embellish it. I don't think it's a, a foregone conclusion. In fact, what I think is that the future is highly uncertain. If we look at what's happened over the past 40 years, there's been an iterative dynamic among all three parties, each responding to the actions and events of the other. And there's no reason to believe that we've arrived at some conclusion, some terminal state of history. Um, what I, I do think is that it's the fundamental interest of all three parties to avoid conflict if possible. And, uh, and there is no inevitability of conflict at all, and that's part of the work that our book is trying to do. One of the things that we want to do is harness this growing interest that exists in the United States around Taiwan and Christ right issues towards productive purposes. And my view is that uh, a lot of energy has been devoted to the security and defense side of that discussion. I think that some of the diplomatic, economic, technological, and other issues have been a bit underweighted in the discussion. And hopefully, uh, through the process of this book, we can begin to balance uh, some of those elements out a bit. Bonnie Glazer, you've answered enough questions of mine on the news hour to know that you're going to answer you're going to answer whatever question you want, regardless of what I ask. <laughs> but rather than giving you the same thing, let me read to you a quote from Eli Ratner. You may know where this is going already. December 2021, Taiwan is located at a critical node within the first island chain, anchoring a network of U.S. allies and partners that is critical to the region's security, critical to the defense of vital U.S. interests in the Indo-Pacific. He went on to say, Taiwan is a stark contrast to deeping authoritarianism and oppression in the PRC. Taiwan has proven the possibilities of an alternative path to that of the Chinese Communist Party. Does the U.S. now view Taiwan as a strategic asset to be kept separate from Beijing? Well, thank you. I want to thank my co-authors for what was a really fun project writing this book and uh, starting off with a tough question, <laughs> Nick. I think uh, that the United States has had a policy of accepting any peaceful, any outcome that is agreed upon peacefully between the two sides of the strait. But uh, we have yet to hear a Biden administration official make that statement. And so in the absence of that statement, I believe that Eli Ratner's description did raise concerns among many people that the United States sees Taiwan as such an important strategic asset that it would, under no circumstances, allow it ever to be integrated into the People's Republic of China. And I think that the danger of uh, that conclusion, if that judgment is made by Beijing, um, is that uh, increasingly this is potentially part of a Chinese assessment that the United States um, has walked away from all of, its, all of the components of its one China policy. And we've heard many Chinese officials express doubt that even President Biden's statements directly to Xi Jinping um, many say are not credible. I hear Chinese experts say that um, on, in various uh, conversations. You know, the president says uh, the U.S. doesn't support Taiwan independence, but the Chinese claim that our actions um, are, don't match our, our words. So my view is that we need to have a clear and consistent set of policies um, from the U.S. administration, and that it's really not in our interest to foreclose the possibility at some point in the future. Um, and this is even part of, uh, of Taiwan's policy, that if there is a majority of people in Taiwan, that if there were to be a referendum, because the people of Taiwan would have to agree that there could be some outcome in which the two sides of the strait uh, find a way to have a relationship that's different than the one that it is today, that door should be left open closing that door creates more potential for crisis. Uh, and Richard Bush, we'll come to you and, and do the history in a second. Um, but we talk so much about uh, U.S. policy, of course, 
We talk so much about Beijing, whether it's military modernization or some of the coercion that it has used uh, with its other tools. The Taiwanese people. There's a sentence in the book, uh, maybe you wrote it, maybe not, but I think you can speak well to this. The will of the Taiwan people to put their democratic system and political autonomy is the center of gravity for determining the future of the Taiwan Strait. Why? Can you explain that? First of all, let me thank um, Ryan for quarterbacking this effort and getting the ball over the goal line. Uh, without his efforts, it wouldn't have happened. Um, this is not a purely military issue. It is a political dispute with a military dimension. And at the end of the day, or what China has been trying to do is persuade uh, the leaders in Taiwan and the people in Taiwan that unification under the terms that they have set forward, the one country, two systems formula, is so in Taiwan's interest that, um, of course, they would want uh, to comply. Um, the people of Taiwan have their own views. Um, they oppose one country, two systems by a wide margin. Um, on the other hand, they don't want to go for a Republic of Taiwan, a completely independent um, entity. Um, they understand that independence means war, uh, and that if Taiwan is seen by the United States as provoking that war, um, they can't be confident that we would come to their defense. Um, so they're very pragmatic. Uh, and the status quo uh, is not perfect, but it's a hell of a lot better than any of the other options. Um, I think that um, it's very important or that Beijing realized that democracy in Taiwan is authentic, uh, that the opinion polls we see are not the result of demagogic um, antics by uh, politicians, politicians right. um, but this is 23 million people who live in a civilized society, uh, and if there's going to be a change in the status quo, they have to be convinced uh, in that it is the right thing to do and that that decision is then carried out through some sort of authoritative mechanism. So I'll take about 25 minutes or so uh, to go through the, the past, present, uh, and, and future, if you will, uh, and then I'll open it up to questions here, and we've got some questions coming in from the audience uh, already. So, Richard, let me, let me start with uh, back in the 40s. Uh, take us through a, a few aspects, and, and we'll get quickly to that that notion that you were ending with about Taiwanese democracy being real. But first, um, why in the 40s did the CCP uh, and the KMT uh, not consider Taiwan particularly important uh, in the 40s? And how, how did that change? Could you have the last Sorry, part? how did the CCP and KMT, or why did the CCP and KMT not consider Taiwan particularly important uh, initially in, in, in the okay, 40s? Got it. And, and how got did it. that change? Um, well, it was... Um, Something of a non-issue um, in the 1930s um, because um, Japan owned Taiwan um, and the Republic of China government acknowledged that. They had a consulate on Taiwan. Um, the CCP and the KMT were fighting their own civil war. Um, however, um, as people started thinking about um, the post-war settlement, uh, it suddenly occurred to um, people in Taiwan, um, people in the United States, um, and the CCP, uh, that who controlled Taiwan would be important. Um, one person involved in this was um, Franklin Roosevelt, and his conception of the post-war order was that the great powers would work together to maintain peace and security, and uh, that this would be done through naval quarantines and air bombardment. And so islands became very important. Uh, and um, so um, it was automatic for him to say 
Taiwan should go back to China. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek had a similar view, and he felt that uh, Taiwan was one of China's fortresses. It was one of the gateways that was guarding China from foreign aggression. And it was much better for the Republic of China to have Taiwan than to not. Um, the communists actually were the last to come to agreement on this. Um, but once they did, um, they've been uh, uh, ferocious as tigers in defending that view. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to fast forward through a lot of Taiwanese uh, history here. Uh, remind us how the Taiwanese gained a seat at the table through democratic reforms and, and how fundamental uh, a shift that was, and, and even to this day, how, how influential is that? Um, Taiwan is the poster child for the third wave of democratization, and uh, it, in a way, sort of proves the hypothesis that a society that goes through social and economic modernization creates uh, a public that wants more of a say over its uh, future. Um, moreover, uh, there's a special factor operating on Taiwan, and that was that um, the KMT under uh, President Chiang Kai-shek um, wanted uh, to impose a conservative version of a Chinese nationality on people. Um, and moreover, uh, Zhang um, had stated the goal of recovery of the mainland and the civil war was still going on and therefore so you couldn't have democracy. Um, his son, Zhang Jinghua, I think had a much different attitude. He was more a man of the people. He recognized uh, in a counterintuitive way that the KMT could better stay in power by opening up this political system than by keeping it tight and um, allow the Taiwanese identity to um, grow and flourish. Um, maybe also to make it harder for the PRC to uh, reach its um, um, unification goals. And so what happened in Taiwan as a result of uh, enlightened thinking by leaders, but also by pressure from um, the opposition and a uh, little bit of pressure from some American congressmen that I know. Um, Taiwan um, made the transition to democracy peacefully, gradually, and in an ethnic Chinese society, which people at the time, that time thought was impossible. And one of the main implications, as you point out, it became in part a struggle between the democratic David and the communist Goliath, and the U.S. instinct was to support David. Mm -hmm. yes. How important is that? Um, it depends on, I think, today on how much um, our political leaders and politicians understand the background of U.S.-China-Taiwan relations. There was a time, not too long ago, when the consensus in the United States was that U.S. interests are served by having a good relationship with China, economic, political, and security. And um, the Soviet Union was the target of that um, policy for a long time. Uh, and then there was the belief that um, uh, if we could cooperate uh, as much as possible with China, um, that would um, um, serve um, peace and prosperity. Uh, it's only been in the last 10 years or so, or even less, that uh, you've had a change in the consensus to viewing China as um, hostile. In the, in the early days, I think our leaders understood the need to balance Taiwan policy and China policy. Uh, now um, there is no balance. And, and you also make one last point. Uh, Xi Jinping did not create the term rejuvenation. This did, is, Xi Jinping did not create the term rejuvenation. This is not something that, uh, I mean, you know, we can say Xi is, uh, yes, to quote, you no. know, Elizabeth is a revolutionary leader, but, you know, he's a, he's a product of the party. That's, and, and it is not uh, the case that she was, yes. has created an idea about Taiwan that yeah. didn't exist before. And whether it's rejuvenation or revival, right. this is actually an ambition that goes back more than a century, that uh, restoring wealth and power to China 
what uh, was uh, the goal of statesmen in the Qing Dynasty, uh, in the Republic of China, and in the People's Republic of China. Um, and the um, corollary of that is that a, a China, at least on the CCP side, a China that does not have Taiwan under control is not a rejuvenated China. Yeah. So, Bonnie Glazer, which brings us to Xi Jinping, uh, who is a, a singular leader. How has he uh, both accelerated uh, what could argue is the fastest military modernization in world history, but also you guys write uh, quite extensive use of other instruments of power, uh, and how has that often been pointed at Taiwan? Well, it's a very important question because, uh, of course, China has been developing militarily for some time. Um, uh, It has been uh, under Xi Jinping that really rapid progress has been made, including breakthroughs that has made China dominant in some areas of military technology like hypersonics. Um, We've seen incredible uh, uh, achievements in space and things like that. But in terms of the toolbox that China has to use uh, against Taiwan, uh, we have seen massive uh, development of uh, disinformation, of uh, cyber tools. When the when, uh, Speaker Pelosi was in Taiwan in August of last year, and then the Chinese initiated their massive display of force after she left. One of the examples of use of cyber was taking control of the um, uh, video cameras, the uh, displays in uh, in the 7-Elevens, you know, throughout mm. Taiwan. Uh, so, and there's been uh, a, a many instances in which there have been uh, uh, attacks to take down government websites. Uh, periodically, representatives from Taiwan's government gives us data on how many attacks there are per day or month, and it's absolutely massive. Mm. Um, and then, of course, there's uh, the media, uh, where there's been purchases of uh, of media uh, in Taiwan, um, and some of that was outed uh, by some uh, journalists who found that there are some media organizations uh, in in Taiwan who have actually been receiving um, uh, money and also instructions from uh, Beijing's Taiwan Affairs Office. So uh, the amount of interference. Um, and forms of pressure is incredible. Um, it really has uh, increased. And the, the latest component that we really didn't see for some time but now is growing is the economic coercion. Mm. And, of course, in a sense, it's almost um, interesting that China had been using economic coercion against so many other countries for a decade but didn't do much against Taiwan because their goal was really economic integration. And so they wanted to give preferences to Taiwanese businesses to come and Thinking invest that in, would, in China. that would lead to, to um, their goals being met. That right. that would be a pathway to unification. Right. But with the um, loosed uh, confidence in that working, we have seen China uh, really take more economic course of measures against Taiwan. And we saw this with the um, a- alleged pests or whatever they claimed uh, was in the pineapples um, and now uh, some kinds of fish. It's, it's really through now over a 1,000 agricultural products. Although if you look at Taiwan's overall exports to China, it's still a real drop in the bucket. So to me, it's a, uh, a, a still a slap on the wrist, but an indication of what China could do. However, if they go into the IT sector, they're going to be harming themselves. And I doubt that China wants to shoot itself in the foot. Well, and that's, that's a big discussion that that we'll certainly have to talk about today in terms of chips. Um, Let's do Taiwan for a second, and then we'll go to U.S. policy. President Tsai. So take us through President Tsai's first campaign, her early missteps. How did she recover? And how has she evolved uh, into taking a a much more harder stance on Beijing? Well, if we go back to when President Tsai first ran for for the presidency in, in, in Taiwan, um, you know, she was ultimately defeated. One of the reasons is I, you know, we I have no proof as to what was decisive, uh, but she did come here to Washington D.C. and meet with U.S. officials, and um, they asked uh, her about her approach to uh, to China, and her questions, her answers were not 
were not adequate? Well, they were only not adequate because they were leaked to the media. God <laughs> forbid they were leaked to the media <laughs> by those U.S. officials who were meeting her, right? I mean, it wasn't only what she said publicly. Right. right. Well, I think her main message uh, privately was, you can trust me, right. um, but not a lot of details about why. Although, if she had answered them in greater detail, perhaps that U.S. officials might have been satisfied. Hmm. So I think this was actually a, 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 a learning process yeah. on uh, Tsai Ing-wen's part. And uh, so ultimately, yeah, she was defeated the first time that she ran. Um, and then um, when she ran again, uh, she, she really brought to this position a tremendous amount of experience, um, more so than I think, and many people who don't know Taiwan well don't know that she is almost really sort of unique um, in Taiwan, having somebody uh, to be prepared to be president, you know, who's an effective politician, who's also been the negotiator for Taiwan's entry into the right. World Trade Organization and, the, you know, the head of the Mainland Affairs Council, all of these different positions that she had. And she's really, I think, came to understand how to navigate effectively both the relationship with China and the relationship with the United States. Um, and it's not necessarily um, one's instinct that helps you navigate relations with either one, particularly the United States. And uh, she understood when she was elected uh, that she needed to uh, uh, try to keep relations with, uh, with China stable. And she really had, I think, a very sophisticated plan, which she initially laid out part of in a speech at, uh, at CSIS down the street. And some of that was repeated in her inaugural address, and then she elaborated on it, where she talked about how her policies would be based on the Republic of China Constitution, the act governing relations across the Taiwan Strait, acknowledging that there had been a meeting between the representatives of the KMT and the CCP in 1992, which I would say went more than halfway toward acknowledging that there was something that somebody later on called the 1992 consensus without embracing it. Um, because let's remember that politically that would have been a de death for her because her party would never have accepted uh, the 1992 consensus. So if you look at all of what she laid on the table um, in her first uh, speech, in that inauguration speech, the speech at CSIS, and I would say her actions in some of the months to come, I think really um, uh, were presented opportunities that Beijing um, did not and should have uh, really responded to. And, and after what, they didn't, how did she evolve a little bit? And what I say in the, in the book is that China set the bar deliberately too high. Right. She never could have crossed it. Um, and so ultimately over time, yes, she took a harder line. Um, we saw that, I think, really even begin that October in her first uh, National Day speech. But it was really after the crackdown in Hong Kong, um, the protest, when she was running for re-election. Um, and her polling was really very low at the time. Um, and I think that was really the, the, the tilt of her, of her policies towards China that just became much tougher, where she accurately stated that the people in Taiwan don't want to live under one country, two systems, and the Chinese pledges toward um, Hong Kong certainly could not be trusted. How could the people of Taiwan ever trust any pledge that would be made uh, towards, towards Taiwan? Yeah. Uh, and she ended up winning by a margin of 25%. Exactly. Um, which brings us pretty much almost to the, to the present day. Um, so, uh, Bonnie, talk, talk about one aspect of what we're seeing in Taiwan today which is there has been a dispute over how to defend the island. Uh, Tsai's National Security Council has embraced what the U.S. has wanted Taiwan to do, which is what we call a porcupine strategy. Uh, the Ministry of National Defense historically uh, has had certain political connections to, to Beijing and also a certain sense of things like tanks and, and F-16s being important uh, to be able to prove to the Taiwanese people that they could defend themselves. Uh, is that dispute still exist? Uh, and what's the implication if it does? Well, the way that I would frame it, as you have said, I answer the questions that I think are important. I would frame it as a debate between how do you balance your resources and investment um, between addressing the, um, uh, the invasion threat and the gray zone threat. 
um, and the gray zone threat is um, everything that the Chinese are doing that are short of triggering uh, the, uh, a, a, a kinetic response. And uh, that includes all the things that I, that I talked about earlier. And so I think that, in, it, that there are people here in the United States who are so worried about the invasion threat that they think that Taiwan should just put all its investment into, uh, uh, into the kinds of capabilities that would prevent the PLA from successfully landing on the beach. Um, you, you know, harpoons and stingers and um, high mars and things of that nature. Whereas Taiwan would say, well, wait a minute, we have so much activity every single day in our air defense identification zone. We actually still need advanced fighter jets. We need to have the pilots that are trained to conduct those kind of intercepts. We need to demonstrate to our own people by doing that that we are defending ourselves. We can't just abandon that mission and just focus on the potential for them to, uh, for the PLA to land on the beach. And so I think that even though the way that the U.S. generally thinks about that balance and the way that Taiwan thinks about the balance is different, and within our countries we also have differences, of course, um, that nevertheless the trend is in the right direction, that Taiwan has started to take much more seriously the need to actually prevent the PLA from establishing a beachhead. They see the invasion threat more seriously than they did several years ago. Um, and I think that the U.S. has come around to understand that there are some areas where they're going to have to compromise and let Taiwan um, cope with these gray zone threats as well. And that does bring us to U.S. policy. So one last one to you, and then, and then Ryan um, will come to you. Uh, Bonnie, you write, there is no policy playbook for supporting Taiwan against Chinese pressure. And I think you're talking about more than just military there. Why, why isn't there that playbook? Um, and how deficient is U.S. policy until that playbook exists? Well, there are probably pieces of it. Um, but the, the ways in which China applies pressure on Taiwan are, are so, um, so deep and so broad. And, and they're growing all the time. And the nature of them is changing. <laughs> And a good example of that is probably disinformation. Uh, we saw, for example, when uh, the Russians invaded Ukraine and there was this massive effort um, to in tell the people of Taiwan that the United States didn't come to Ukraine's rescue. And so therefore, of course, the U.S. is unreliable. It's not going to come to Taiwan's rescue. Um, and I don't see that as being a credible narrative, but um, I'm surprised how many people in Taiwan are worried about that. And I was recently uh, in Taiwan when this story broke that President Biden wants, has this plan to destroy Taiwan, um, <laughs> which I thought was absolutely ludicrous, but was very interesting. How many people were really worried about that? It's like, wait a minute, President Biden has said four times he'll come to Taiwan's defense if China attacks. What do you mean you think this is credible? But that's exactly what I mean by helping um, support Taiwan against Chinese uh, pressure. And it's what we're doing, it's how we're communicating it to the people of Taiwan, and it's also how we're communicating it to China, and even communicating it to other countries so that we can get other countries on board with a strategy. Uh, and so there's so many different layers of this. Um, I give the administration credit for making an effort and making headway on some of those pieces. I actually think internationalizing the Taiwan Strait, getting countries um, in Europe, for example, to have more of a stake, to see that they have a stake in the preservation of peace and stability in Taiwan, I think is something that the Biden administration has really made some really good strides in. Yeah. But there doesn't seem to be a really overall sort of whole of government strategy to help push back against um, this pressure. Taiwan needs to have more confidence. If it, the, the, the risk of Taiwan losing confidence in its government mm. and in the United States is enormous because as we write in the book, um, first and foremost, China's strategy is one to induce psychological despair um, in the people of Taiwan, that they have no choice other than to give in to China. Um, and to take whatever Beijing puts on the table. And we have to avoid that from happening. Ryan Haas, you write, it's important to remind Beijing of its vulnerabilities. The U.S. must provide reassurance that the U.S. is open to any peaceful resolution. 
Why is Beijing looking for reassurance? Why do you think reminding Beijing of vulnerabilities would make a difference? Well, Nick, I will do my best to answer that question. But first, I want to dwell on one point that, uh, that Richard made, one point that Bonnie made, because I think that it's absolutely foundational to the argument in this book. Richard was pointing out that since the Qing Dynasty, the Republic of China, the People's Republic of China, there has been a, a through line, a continuous thread of ambition to absorb Taiwan, just as it has absorbed Xinjiang, Tibet, and Hong Kong. Taiwan is, is the last crown, last jewel in the crown for, for China, and it's something that they're very committed to. The reason why I think this is such an important point is because it belies the notion that if we just had a little bit more military capability or a little bit more fervor in support of Taiwan, that this would all solve itself and China would retreat and uh, abandon its ambitions. This is, this is sort of foundational to, to the challenge. What it means is that strength alone is not going to solve this problem. Smarts are going to be increasingly necessary to deal with it and manage it. And so I'm, I'm really glad that, that Richard made that point. And, and I think that Bonnie has do, just done a tremendous service in talking about the two paths that are running parallel leading to the same destination for Beijing. One is a military path with an invasion type scenario. The other is what she talked about, this coercion without violence. Hmm. And if we fixate on one and ignore the other, we're missing, we're missing the, the terrain upon which this, this competition, this challenge is being fought. And so I think it's absolutely critical, and I'm, I'm glad that, um, that Bonnie really focused on this. We know uh, that if we, from, from hard personal experience, that if we wanted to create a New York Times bestseller, we would put a mushroom cloud on the cover that was <laughs> initiated by an AI-enabled robotic warfare. <laughs> uh, that's how you sell uh, books and attract attention. That's not what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to, to nudge this discussion into a, a little bit more holistic, uh, comprehensive view of, of the nature of the challenge. And that sort of gets to the question that, that you raised, which is why, why should uh, the United States be open to any potential future scenario uh, in the Taiwan Strait? And I think our argument is what would be the value of stealing problems from the future? What would the United States gain by foreclosing uh, a potential uh, solution uh, to cross-strait differences? And what cost or risk would we incur in the process? The people of Taiwan have no enthusiasm for uh, near-term unification. This is not something that, uh, that many in the United States need to spend a lot of time staying up at night worrying about. Uh, the people of Taiwan also are very pragmatic and have shown through repeated elections that they also don't have a lot of appetite for declarations of independence. The, the goal of U.S. policy and strategy isn't to solve the Taiwan problem. The, the people of Taiwan, people on the mainland China, they're not looking for the United States to play a mediating role. As, as Richard said, this is an artifact of an unfinished civil war. The purpose of American strategy and policy is to keep a path open for a resolution to be found by the protagonists themselves. That could take years. It could take decades. It could take centuries. I don't know. I can't. Although there is a deadline that Xi Jinping has said. No? Well, we, we should talk about that. We should talk about that. Um, but but this, is, this is where we need to orient our thinking, uh, not towards speculating about whether 2024, 2025, 2027 is going to be this, uh, this timeline for a PRC invasion. As far as I know, 2026 is still open on the bingo board if anyone wants it. But, um, <laughs> but seriously, we need to really sort of um, uh, sharpen our thinking and have a little bit more discipline and precision because sure. the stakes couldn't be higher. Yeah, but so quickly address that, that idea that you have. Because, of course, you know, there are some who disagree, which I'll ask you in a second. But explain why reassurance is important to Beijing that the U.S. remains open to whatever Taiwan decides uh, in the future, despite President Biden's uh, four, four statements, uh, and why somehow reminding Beijing of its vulnerabilities would make a difference. Well, the purpose of you know the purpose of our efforts in reminding Beijing of its vulnerabilities is not to uh, embarrass them or induce them to feel a need to respond, but to just make clear that we know and they know that there are indivisible risks that Beijing would face if they were ever to choose a military pathway to try to resolve uh, this conflict. Just as the United States has really focused in on, on, on Russian vulnerabilities after its brutal invasion of Ukraine, uh, I think a similar process would play itself out uh, if there ever were a military conflict in the Taiwan Strait. China's economy is 10 times or nine times larger than Russia's. Its vulnerabilities are different than Russia's, but it has significant vulnerabilities. Uh, and, uh, and we don't need to spend a ton of time 
highlighting them, but, but we should make sure that the Chinese are aware of uh, our capacity to deal with those vulnerabilities should it ever become necessary to do so. And on the reassurance side, Nick, you know, Thomas Schelling, who's a, a, a real famous political scientist, has written about deterrence. And the line between deterrence and provocation is pretty thin. Mm. Uh, but good deterrence also has an element of reassurance to it. And if you have deterrence without reassurance, then really all you're doing is trying to back someone into a corner. Uh, as, as you know, because I told you uh, off stage, I, I talked to uh, some of your successors on the National Security Council staff after uh, you left. Uh, and uh, reiterated your argument, which, of course, others make as well. Uh, and they point out Beijing isn't after, or they argue, they, Beijing is not after reassurance, it's after concessions, and that Beijing will not act based on some kind of lack of U.S. reassurance, but Beijing will act when it is capable of achieving what it wants. Can you respond to that? Well, I welcome my, my co-authors to respond as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that there's just a philosophical disagreement. I mean, it, the idea is that a measure of capabilities will be determinative of uh, whether Beijing chooses to uh, invade Taiwan. I would offer the past decades as, uh, as counterproof to that argument. Uh, I also would posit that, that w show us the evidence, show us your work uh, to make this case. Because what I hear President Xi telling his people is that China is winning that they're on a path leading towards their goal of unification, that, uh, that they, should, they should stay on their current course, and that uh, they are capable of uh, achieving uh, the outcomes that they seek through their current strategy. So other than the fact that China is engaging in a significant military buildup, which we all should take seriously and, and pay careful attention to, but it also is similar to every other previous rising power in modern history, sure. what is the evidence to suggest that uh, that, that, that argument uh, is accurate? And I want but to I, sure, sure, okay, very quickly because I want to get one last question to Ryan, and then we've got the audience to, by two forty-five. So quickly, we're both going to jump in real okay, quick. Okay, fair enough. Um, I think that um, uh, Beijing uh, that, that reassurance is very is 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 important to Beijing's decision making. So if in, as you know, Schelling's pieces, if, if you don't have credible that deterrence is composed of credible threats and credible assurance. Sure. So if, if the Chinese believe that the United States has essentially abandoned its one China policy, then what is the point for them to, I mean, not go ahead and use force if they believe that we have crossed what is really their red lines? Mm -hmm. I believe they have, they have two red lines that, are, that are, are real. The rest of them, I believe, are not. One is that the United States essentially resurrects the um, uh, mutual defense treaty with Taiwan, and the other is that we, we, we accept that Taiwan is an independent sovereign state. Right. And if the people in the White House, they would tell you they don't have the intention of doing either of those, but if the Chinese believe that, that that's where we're headed, sure. then we are really headed toward a crisis. So it's not just an issue of concessions. We have to provide a consistent and, and credible and coherent policy. What I try to lay out in my section of the book is how this administration actually has not done that. Mm -hmm. It has been very unclear, contradictory, inconsistent, uh, so that the Chinese are basically left wondering, what is our policy? Do we, is, there, is there any reason why they won't wake up tomorrow and find out that the United States actually is going to recognize an independent Taiwan? I personally think that's dangerous. Oh, which is why I love um, with Eli. Sorry, Richard. <laughs> two, two quick points. First of all, reassurance is only useful for a party that wants to be reassured. Um, and I think that um, Beijing finds it more convenient uh, to um, not accept our um, expressions of restraint and prefer to just call us liars. Second, in talking about capabilities and deadlines and whatnot, let's remember... Um, that Taiwan has a say in this. And if in 2024 they were to elect right. a president who was more to Beijing's liking and uh, who was willing to go back to the sort of situation we had between 2008 and 2014, as difficult as that might be, um, I think that um, uh, a lot of emphasis on military issues would disappear. Um, because we would be in a zone of uh, more cooperation than 
hostility. Well, and, and to that last point, and Ryan, very quickly, sorry, um, you, you point out, you know, next year is, is an election year, not just in the U.S., uh, and that you talk about how the window is closing. Be you want to avoid Beijing feeling like the window is closing. Is there a scenario in which the Taiwanese election, uh, not U.S. military or not U.S. administration statements, makes Beijing feel like the window is closing? Well, anything is hypothetically possible, and it's uh, you know it's it's dangerous to be speculative on a stage in front of a hundred smart people. But I, I don't see a, a high likelihood of that in the near term. Uh, I think that uh, the Taiwan has uh, two major parties that are running for uh, the election, and there's a third party as well. But the incumbent party, the Democratic Progressive Party, its candidate is William Lai. Uh, and I think that he is a professional politician who is going to appeal to where uh, the majority of the voters are because he wants to become president and, and win the election. And the majority of the voters are in a space that uh, is pretty pragmatic, that uh, is not on one extreme of independence or the other of unification. And so uh, I don't think that, that the people of Taiwan are going to provide a provocation uh, that would trigger uh, conflict anytime soon. Okay, I've gone a little bit long, so um, let me turn it over to the audience. And if you could, uh, keep your questions singular and brief. As my father would say, keep your brilliance brief. Okay, let, right in the middle here. Uh, yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. And please identify yourself uh, quickly. Hi, uh, so this is Janelle from Formosa Association for Public Affairs. So I have one question regarding, because you mentioned that the Biden administration had uh, focus on engaging the stakeholders in the regions and then to put the issue outward to engage all the stakeholders, but without, most, without more substantial measures. So my question is, do you think that in the coming year, the Biden administration will have more, a broader and substantial measure, especially in economic relations with Taiwan? Let's say that they might accelerate the U.S.-Taiwan FTA or to have like the more substantial implementation of IPEF in the region. Um, Bonnie, you want to take that? So, so you know, sure. w will the U.S. accelerate economic connections with Taiwan, including an FTA, possibly? I think it's quite likely that the uh, 21st century uh, initiative on trade uh, with, with Taiwan will be completed. I think that the first five chapters have basically been completed. Uh, there are seven more to go. I think that's the most likely thing. I, I wouldn't say it's low-hanging fruit because it's still going to be hard. There's a few chapters that are going to be very difficult. But I think that that's doable. Um, I think it's highly unlikely that Taiwan is going to be included as a member of IPEF. Um, and uh, it, I suppose... Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Yes, yeah. which was Which was launched on the same day that Biden vowed to defend Taiwan militarily. Yes, without and, Taiwan. and <laughs> the main reason is that the number of, a number of the countries that joined would not have become part of it if the United States had included Taiwan. And that was a trade-off. That was a decision that the Biden administra administration made. That said, if you look at the chapters in this 21st century trade agreement, you'll see it really mirrors the IPEF agreement and probably will be completed before the mm -hmm. IPEF agreement. Mm -hmm. So eventually, yes, we could be moving towards something that might be something like a free trade agreement with Taiwan. But as you heard from probably right here, um, when uh, our national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, gave a speech uh, a few days ago, uh, there is still a strong belief in the administration that market access should not be the litmus test of whether or not a trade agreement is a good agreement. So there will be, I think, continued development in our economic relationship um, with Taiwan, but it may not look like the kind of free trade agreement that we have seen in the past or the agreement that, uh, that Taiwan wants. And just one more sentence is um, I think we should stay tuned and watch if there will be progress on the avoidance of double taxation agreement, because I think that has really gained some traction. Um, in the Congress, in the administration, and there is the potential, I think, for some, some progress there, too. There are a couple of hands here, uh, so let's go front row, uh, and then we'll go second row, and then we'll go back there. Uh, Antoine van Aknaal, I, I wondered about two things. One, I wondered how many mainland Chinese there are in this room, because it's, it's an issue of China and, and, and Taiwan. And the second question is, there's one four-letter word that I haven't heard at all, the word TSMC. And when you're talking about Taiwan as a strategic interest, I would think that that would be 
probably one of the main reasons for Taiwan being a strategic in interest. So I wonder whether you can address that, particularly given the fact that, that Taiwan is now making a major investment in Phoenix, although we should keep in mind that the percentage of Taiwan's investment in in the U.S. is about as large as the percentage of the Taiwanese population to the Chinese population, <laughs> namely about 2%, but, but still. All right, chips. Uh, who wants to do chips? chips yeah. Richard, you want to? Well, um, obviously, um, TSMC is an asset for the world. Um, it's an asset for China. Um, it is, I think, a good reason why China would prefer to resolve this political dispute peacefully um, in the hopes that it would get access to the technology and talent that comes with TSMC and a lot of other Taiwan companies that are um, world class. Um, and um, so that can be a stabilizing factor. Um, and um, the, uh, I think it makes perfect sense for um, TSMC to uh, diversify a little bit. Um, TSMC has probably been one of the most conservative Taiwan companies in, in transferring their technology and their operations to China because they know those are the crown jewels and uh, um, it's better to keep them in Taiwan or some other safe place. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Dong Huiyu with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. And uh, the campaign for the 2024 Taiwan election uh, is coming, and the, all parties are considering their candidates. From your perspective, what kind of candidate is in the best interest of the United States? In other words, what kinds of message that the Washington would like to hear from the candidates? Thank you. Right, well, um, okay. In, uh, right before the 2000 election, I was chairman of AIT. I was sent to give this message. Number one, the United States has no preference. Uh, it's the Taiwan voters who should uh, decide who their leader is. What's important um, are whether the interests of Taiwan's elected leaders um, overlap and coincide with those of the United States. Um, in terms of this election, um, I look at a little, it a little more broadly, and I think that what's very important is that Taiwan voters get a good choice when they cast their vote. Um, that they are presented with two or maybe three different policy approaches to the many different uh, problems that Taiwan is facing, and that uh, these policy packages be detailed, comprehensive, substantive, and smart. The people of Taiwan deserve to have a good choice. Uh, and if they're denied a good choice because of politics or other things, uh, it would be a shame. Ryan, you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I agree with everything that Richard said. I would just add it's wonderful to have a representative from the DPP and the KMT sitting <laughs> next to each other, smiling and laughing as, uh, as you ask your questions. So there is, there is hope for comedy in, uh, in, in, in the political space. But I, at a deeper level, I would say that uh, it's in America's interest for Taiwan to have strong, solid, rich governance that provides optimism and hope for the future of Taiwan. Because the, the more confidence Taiwan has in its own future, the less space there is uh, for, for any outside meddling or interference or efforts to try to create divisions or gaps uh, inside Taiwan's politics. And that's fundamentally in America's interest. And right, I, if I yes, could sir. just add sure. just a couple of sentences to that. Um, we definitely, even though p people ask me this question all the time, I agree with Richard, we really, the United States does not have a preference. But we would like to have a leader in, in Taiwan and administration that is forthcoming with us. Um, we don't like surprises, just as Taiwan doesn't like surprises from the United States. We want to have good consultations, um, particularly given the risks now and the rising tensions in the Taiwan Strait. We just really want to have an administration that represents the opinions of its people. After all, it will be democratically elected, and, and, and we have good channels with. Um, and I think that's, that would be the minimum. 
So I'll hand on this side, and then I'll go for one for online. OK, never mind. Uh, all the way in the back. Uh, Right there? Yeah. Uh, I'm Roger Cochetti, uh, an author and editorial contributor on technology policy to the Hill newspaper. And I'm sorry to drag you back into the discussion about a New York Times bestseller with a nuclear explosion on the cover. But I think whether you're a news correspondent for the News Hour or the President of the United States, one of the issues that I think is in the back of everyone's mind is how important is this discussion? In other words, should I devote one-tenth of one percent of my attention to it, or should I devote 10 percent of my attention to it? And the end of that question really is what is your assessment of the question of a present course and speed, not your preference, but your assessment at present course and speed the likelihood that Taiwan will declare independence, China will militarily respond, and the United States will militarily respond, bringing us into a war between the United States and China. Sorry to put you on the spot, no, no, but that's in the back of everybody's mind. Let's just, and let's just combine questions. We are running out of time. So second row up here. This gentleman's very patient. Thank you. And we'll combine the questions. Uh, thanks very much uh, for doing this. Uh, Robert Delaney, South China Morning Post. Just a quick question about uh, we've had the Biden administration uh, engaged in a lot of activity with uh, Japan, with South Korea, with the Philippines uh, recently. And uh, what's come out and their military bases, access to military bases in the Philippines, Japan, of course, uh, upping the amount of military spending it's conducting. And last week, the uh, Washington agreement with South Korea. To what extent is all of this? Uh, to what extent can we consider all of this deterrence in terms of uh, China uh, uh, making a kinetic move against Taiwan? And to what extent is it deterrence without any of the sort of uh, reassurance that we were talking about? Thank you. All right, so Bonnie, why don't you take the, the regional allies and the regional? I to you take want to do the first, first one. All right, so. Sorry. <laughs> all right, you take the first one, and then uh, we'll jump in on the allies in a second. Okay, so bottom line, how close are we to war? There are many scenarios <laughs> that could lead to crisis. The one that you um, articulated, I think, is the least likely. In other words, that Taiwan just out of the blue declares independence. Uh, so uh, I think it is, it is more likely that the um, developments internally in the PRC, potentially lack of trust in the, the United States that the PRC has, um, maybe a PRC assessment that Taiwan is, is inexorably heading towards independence, whether it declares it or not. Uh, all, there are many different variables um, could eventually provoke a, uh, a Chinese attack. So I don't think it would start with, with, with a Taiwanese declaration of independence. I think that this is the um, probably the uh, the Taiwan Strait is the is really the only potential trigger of a major war between the United States and China. Two nuclear powers, which we have never seen, um, two nuclear powers go to war uh, with uh, uh, no confidence on. I, I think that escalation could be controlled. Yeah. So this is the most worrisome scenario going forward. Uh, certainly, the prospects for war are growing. They are not be, being more uh, diminished, right? So, um, you know, how much percentage of your time you spend on it, I don't know. But I think that what needs to be done is an effort by many people who write about it, journalists, authors, people who speak on these issues, to really bring a, facts um, to these issues and, and to bring some sort of sense of sanity, uh, uh, to have a really informed debate on what is necessary in order to prevent that, that war from happening, which at least the three of us believe that this is a war that is avoidable. Ryan, I'm sure you want to answer that, but also do, do engage, and you get the last word, with the idea of you know, these regional moves that the Biden administration has worked very hard on and is quite proud of. Well, I think from Beijing's perspective, their preference would be to try to isolate Taiwan as an issue between Taiwan and China and to just deal with it on their own. And they feel like if they can isolate this, the problem into that sort of set, they can impose their will upon the people of Taiwan. They don't like uh, this being an annex of U.S.-China competition. They really don't like Taiwan being embedded into a broader regional or global framework. 
because that means that others around the world have a stake in what happens in the Taiwan Strait. And as Richard observed with Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, this is abundantly a global issue. Uh, and the Biden administration, I think, has done a commendable job of helping to uh, turn Taiwan not into an annex of U.S.-China competition, but into an issue upon which uh, countries around the globe have a stake in preserving peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. So I, I give them credit for that. Uh, there are more questions online, but unfortunately I have <laughs> run out of time. Uh, so I apologize to those who submitted online, and I apologize if you were trying to ask a question here. Uh, but one of the things that we try and do here is keep the ship on time. So thank you very much to all of you for being here, and thank you to the authors. <laughs>